you watched the strange thing about the Johnsons, and you you knew you just smelled that Ari Aster was the real deal, and he is. And I just like I remember you were like, this guy is going to make something that's going to be really really special. You called that man, and not a lot of people understood that short film. You know, it, it was really you know he was kind of trolling everybody, but he made something really I think vibrant and important and like really smart and terrifying and like I was just very impressed that you got it immediately. Hey everybody, Corey here. It's in the middle of the day. You know I'm not up doing it. Well, actually it's four o'clock, so I, had, I should have my ass up at this point. But if I'm up doing something this early, because we usually do stuff at night, you know I'm doing a double toasted interview. And if I'm doing a double toasted interview, you know, I'm very picky about who I talk to. And if, if it's somebody I'm interviewing, then it must be somebody who I look at as being very special, someone that might have influenced me, or someone that just does incredible work. And it is truly an honor today, and you didn't even see what happened before the interview started. I don't even, man, this, <laughs> and if I'm, hey, look, if I'm flustered or if I, if I, again, if I'm speechless, it's your fault, man, because this man just gave me the hugest compliment. He just, he's a big compliment by being here, but the, the flattering words that he had to say just really just had me all flustered and, and hot and bothered. And today I'm here <laughs> with Mr. Zach Kreger, and Zach, they might know you, a lot of people might know you from, Many of the things you do, you uh, you're part of one of the founders of uh, the whitest kids, you know. Uh, That's but right. also, uh, you did what is one of my favorite movies of the year. But you know, enough of uh, me talking and enough of an intro. Uh, I'll let you just come in and start taking it here from from uh, from this point on. Again, people, Zach Craig, thanks for being here, man. I mean, well, well, I'm, I said this a little before we started, but I'm going to say it again. I'm I'm so happy to be here. I, I've listened to your show. I think you are like really, really sharp. I love your takes on stuff. And I just, I laugh every time I watch you. So I'm a fan and like this, this is, uh, this is special for me. So, so let's do it, man. I, I, I couldn't be happier to be here. Oh man, quit, quit. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go on. Uh, all right. All right. I <laughs> know this is, that, that really does mean the world to me that you said that. And as I stated before, that's because you did what is absolutely one of my favorite movies. I love this film, man. And thank you. We talked about this. We reviewed this a couple of weeks ago. All of us loved it here at Double Toasted. And if you don't mind, could I show a clip to uh, your movie, Barbarian? Oh, I love it. Yeah, Barbarian is a horror movie that just came out. And there are so many reasons why I love this. And you're going to find out why as I ask Zach questions. But if you haven't seen the film, here's a little bit of a clip right here. And there's so many things I just love about this trailer, besides this trailer freaking me the hell out, but it's really one of the most effective trailers that I've seen in a while. But, uh, Zach, I want to ask you something that, and forgive me if people have asked you this before, because for you now, this is probably an obvious question, but you are now on a, a list of, of, of people, and this, this list is getting longer, people who are comedians, people who are associated with comedy, who have successfully transitioned over to horror. You know, needless to say, we have Jordan Peele here, but we also have Danny McBride and David Gordon Green. Uh, you have, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 John, Krasinski. John, Jonathan, John Krasinski, who did A Quiet Place. Uh, even Kevin Smith did Red State and Tusk. And then you had Dave Franco, who did The Rental, which actually kind of fits in the category that you fit in with your movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so again, you've probably been asked this, but man, what is it that, about horror that's attracting all these comedy people? 
Well, I think that they're very similar. I mean, I, I think that my time in comedy was really working out the same muscle group that I use in horror. You know, they're both about uh, tone and timing used in conjunction to bring about a visceral response from the viewer. They're about subverting expectations and zigging when the audience expects you to zag. I mean, they're, they're both in a weird way, like kind of mathematic. And, um, and, I, and I mean that in, in only to say that like the subtlest little adjustment to the equation of building a joke or building a scare will have uh, a profound effect. And so, so you can really get in the weeds on both and, and, um, and it's like oftentimes like a frame by frame sort of a thing of, of whether a joke is gonna work or a scare is gonna work. And so I'm just, I'm kind of been uh, accustomed to like getting in there and, and analyzing and, and mm -hmm. finding those little beats and the timings and, so I, I I just think they're they're very very similar. Yeah, I you know it's just the way that people say comedians can transition uh, to to comedy more than you know uh, people who do drama. I mean, so tra comedians can transition to uh, uh, drama more than probably dramatic actors can transition to uh, to comedy. You know, I can see what you're that saying. That seems there. to be true. Yeah. Um, so I was talking about how your movie has a lot in common with another actor on here, uh, Dave Franco. You know, one of the things that I haven't talked about with your movie is that, I don't know, people back in the day, they used to say that this movie is the jaws of dot, dot, dot. You know, right, it'll, right. it'll make you be afraid to go do this. Kind of, your movie is like the jaws of Airbnbs, man. You know, it's, it'll make you, because it freaked me out. I'm about to go on a trip, and it's freaking me out to go get an Airbnb, man. I'm getting a hotel instead of an Airbnb because of your movie. <laughs> uh, but have you seen... Uh, have you seen Dave Franco's movie, uh, The Rental? Yeah, I thought it was great. I, I was a big fan of The Rental. I thought he did a really excellent job. It, it was really tense. Um, you know, it took a hard left turn in the middle of the movie that I did not see coming. So, um, yeah, I thought it was great. You know, it's, I watched it uh, when it came out because I had already written my movie and I was worried that it was going to basically mm -hmm. be uh, a problem for me. But uh, they're very different. So. Yeah, no, they are. Even though when I was reviewing your movie, I said in there, I said, your film would make a great double feature with The Rental. I, yeah, I, I think a lot of people say that my film would be a good double feature with Malignant. You know, I've heard that a lot just because they're both really kind of bizarre. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm with you on The Rental. <laughs> uh, and when, you know, people, I, I imagine even today when people know your background, you know, with, with, with uh, sketch comedy and comedy in general, they're kind of surprised to, to, to learn that you're in the horror, just like people were surprised to learn that Jordan Peele was so into horror. Uh, and I know that you said that for, for this movie, Barbarian, you said that a couple of things had a lot of influences on it, one of those being uh, Sam Raimi's Evil Dead 2. Which very much yeah a lot of people love uh, when when they a lot of people go into hard always mention uh, uh, Evil Dead too it's a great film man but I mean was before that what were some of your influences uh, coming up that influenced you in horror well definitely definitely Sam Raimi and Drag Me to Hell and all that was big for me um, I would say the biggest spiritual ancestor of of Barbarian is probably Audition. I don't know if you've seen that 1999 Takashi Miike film, oh, yeah. but that that's really a big one for me. And that it's it's a it's a radical political movie that doesn't feel very political, which I think is excellent. And it's shocking. Uh, you know, look at this lady; it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. And um, they're both examining male privilege in a way that isn't necessarily shoving it down your throat. Um, and they both subvert act structure, you know. I, I thought that audition really breaks a lot of rules in, a, in an exciting way. So I was I was really inspired by that. And then also, you know, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't ever begin to deny the impact that Get Out had on me, you know. Oh, hello. Um, and Jordan made funny, and it just gave me permission to like write in my own style, you know, and like let myself be funny. Am I freezing up? Oh uh, yeah, it froze up for just a second. Uh, you, you, did you hear me? Should I repeat myself? Oh, uh, you know, you were talking about how I tell you where you where you stopped. You t you stopped where you said that Jordan Peele and Get Out was definitely an influence on you. 
Yeah, and just just that he was able to make a movie that was so funny and so uh, so scary at the same time, and it felt authentically like his voice, and it just it gave me permission to write in my own voice and like not not be afraid to lean into the funny stuff and not be afraid to lean into the scary stuff. You know, um, he you know Jordan and I are, are friends, and and he was really helpful to me. You know, before I went to go shoot the movie, you know, he gave me a lot of like invaluable advice. And then when I came back and I had the movie in a rough cut, you know, he watched it and gave me some notes. And so I was really, really fortunate to be able to like, you know, pick the brain of a, of a, of a genius. And, um, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a huge influence on me for sure. No, that's, that is very fortunate to have him, uh, you know, yeah. getting you back like I, that. I, I would yeah. say, in, in, I think, you know, we, we were careful not to try to compare you because, I mean, that's the thing that that's the go to now. Everybody says Jordan Peele whenever, especially have somebody who's coming from comedy into horror. And I want to be very careful not to compare you to Jordan Peele, but then I compared you to Jordan Peele when we did it. And, and you know, we did that in the best way because what happened with the, uh, your movie, I think that what made it so great is that you did have that balance of horror and comedy in there um, where it didn't come out. One, one was, didn't seem to overshadow the other. And usually that's the problem when people do comedy with horror. The comedy is just so precious, man. You know, it's it, and it really does kind of stick out. Uh, I think the key is to not to be not to be obviously funny. The humor has to feel natural. And I think that's where you got it done, man. And that's where I compared you to Jordan Peele, even though I really didn't want to come on that strong. And that's what I thought was so great about your movie, man. Oh well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I, like Jordan does in Get Out. I've never wanted to have a joke for the sake of having a joke. You know, it all should come. From the situation and the character, and um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm proud that it doesn't feel too far in one direction or the other. Yeah, uh, no, great balance right there, man. And, didn't, and like I said, it didn't seem didn't seem artificial, didn't seem phony. But the other thing with your film is that, I, listen, man, I'm gonna look. Can I? I'm just, I'm just gonna kiss your ass for a moment. I mean, that's just how it's gonna oh, be. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Just bend over and just be ready for it, man. That's how it's gonna be. Um, you, I just think you're just a wonderful director. And, oh, thank you, Corey. Well, the reason why is because, first of all, you you know how to, to how to direct suspense. I mean, you're a perfect horror director, man. You know how to actually build build a, a, a build up a scene. You know how to build up a moment, right? There. You know how to build up tension. And I think that, and I got to ask you something about this. I I don't like jump scares like most people today. I know that sounds like, you know, very much like a snob, but I'm not a fan of jump scares. There is a jump scare in your movie. And, uh, you there's know, a but, few. There's a few. Well, there's a few, but, the, you know, the few that, that you have, they're not the obvious jump scares. You know, they're not, they're, they're not the ones where, some, you know, somebody's looking down and somebody comes up and puts their hand on their shoulder and, like, and it's nothing. You know, it's actually, you know, the, what, what you do is, is yours has some kind of payoff. But there was one jump scare like that in in the movie and i was you know and this is me putting on my pretentious critic hat i was like well he he did that to actually make fun of the jump scares in other movies I, you know i don't know if i was right or not but there was one jump scare where a character comes up behind somebody and i think that you kind of did that on purpose almost to, uh, as a way to throw people off with their expectations of an obvious jump scare i i did sorry god i, I wish our connection was better but i think you're talking about when when bill comes up with the phone right yeah Okay, so you're right, and I love that you pointed that out. So I'm definitely trying to not show my hand that this movie is actually going to be nasty, and I want people to think that they've got this movie figured out. You know, that's kind of the whole point of the first half hour is to make you think you're watching a different movie than you're watching, one that doesn't have the fangs that I think this movie has, and one that you are already two steps ahead of us and you know that Keith is the bad guy, and, and that's just gonna make everything hit so much harder when I get you down under the house and I, and I punch you in the face. You know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. So I, I really appreciate that you, uh, that you clocked that. And it is a little bit of a weak jump scare. And I put a lame sound over it kind of on purpose. <laughs> and I'm also very self-conscious about it. You know, when I watch this in a theater and it's time for that jump scare, I, I sink down in my seat a little bit and I'm worried that people are gonna get up and walk out because it's, it's lame. You know what I mean? I showed it to, to Fede Alvarez, who's a friend of mine who made uh, Don't Breathe and mm-hmm. Evil Dead, the, the remake. And he, he hit me on that. He was like, yeah, that first jump scare sucks. And I was like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, it does, I know. But I'm gonna keep it. And uh, I, I, don't, I also don't love my couch jump scare either. I think it's also kind of lame. 
Um, now yeah. I'm definitely trying harder on that couch jump scare, but but it's not great. And um, but I'm okay with it because again, it's like if you're boxing with somebody, you're gonna throw a couple of weak ones so that they get comfortable, so that yeah. when you actually jaw them, you hit them hard. You know. So that's that's what I hope I'm doing. Hey, listen, I 100% think that that jump scare w was effective. Because okay, cool. he, because I think the audience it makes it does put them in a place where they think they know what they're getting into, yeah, and and they don't and and the thing is it's effective for the people who do love predictable horror movies. I mean, you know, come on, sure. the, the, some of the, the worst horror movies make you know they, they make a lot of money and they're successful because they are playing on people's weak ass you know expectations like that. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, you know, and, and the other thing though with their directing in the movie besides being able to you know just directing suspense and horror very well. It's just a lot of creative stuff that you do in the movie, man. You know, a lot of creative uh, one shots, uh, a lot of creative, you know, uh, angles. You know, your director, is, 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 there's a lot of imagination that goes into it. You know, the stuff that happens with the, uh, with the, in the flashback, with, mm. I don't know what to say without spoiling for everybody, but the father, you know, the, um, I, I love the way you directed that whole scene. A, and I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but there's a scene where somebody is scoping somebody out methodically scoping somebody out. And the way you just kind of paced that and directed that, and also, you know, some of the shots that you took with that, especially inside the car, they were very mm. good, man. So, you know, I just think that you just have just a very creative eye, not just for directing horror, but directing horror in general. Uh, and I was leading, I'm gonna be leading up to somewhere like uh, with this, but if you have something to say on that, please do. Well, it, you know, I, I really appreciate the compliment and I'll, I'll take it, but I also have to point out that, you know, so much, and, and this is not, um, I'm not self-conscious about this, so much of, of every director, you know, you steal from other movies. And so, for example, that flashback, I'm stealing from this Austrian movie from 1983 called Angst, which if you have not seen it, I, I can't really recommend it because it's incredibly violent and disturbing and it's, it's a little too hardcore even for me. But they use a visual style in that movie that I really liked. And so I just showed that to my DP and I was like, let's, let's do this for the flashback. Um, now, I mean, obviously I take a lot of creative license and I put my own spin on it and that car thing is all me but like um mm -hmm. but but it it is part of the joy of being a director is like picking from all the movies that you grew up loving and and you know making your own stew with them so mm -hmm. um yeah well no it's uh i mean but you know everybody does that i mean I think everybody yeah, that's you true. know goes into something nobody's going there you know that much of a genius where they're just going in cold and reinventing stuff you know everybody's yeah. influenced by somebody uh and you use your influence as well but you know I was going to say that you, and of course you're an actor, you've done a lot of acting. Um, you've been acting for a while. If you don't mind, I'm going to show a little something from back in the day. I don't know if this oh is one of your first, <laughs> I don't know if this is one of your first acting roles, but you, uh, you def you're definitely uh, fresh faced in this. this oh, is, here we go. Yeah, 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 you probably know what's coming up. I, I don't know. Oh, boy. I'll lock you up for shooting your Wait, friend. wait, I didn't shoot him. It's <laughs> in why don't you just tell us what really happened tonight, okay? All right, we weren't on Eager. We were in D.C. Washington, D.C.? Doing what? Buying crystal meth. Damn, Zach, you went hard, man. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> the ravages of, meth. of time. I look, I look like a ghoul compared to that little kid. It's sad. No, no, man, Zach, you're one of those guys of... <laughs> You, you've gotten you've gotten better and better looking with age, man. <laughs> you know? oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. No, no, man. You you know this is homicide, uh, life on the streets. This is back in 1998. As I said, you little fresh faced kid right there, man. Um, thing is, I also now here's what I was going to bring up when I said I was going when I was I told you I was going to say something uh, before we started. And I wanted to say it for the for the interview. I, I wish I had actually found this from back in the day, but I, I interviewed you years ago. Years ago, man. Yeah, you, you and Trevor Moore, man. Back, uh, back when you guys, back when you were in Austin promoting this film. I think it was during South by Southwest. Oh Have you put God. any thought into this at all? We should totally get that oh boy. to get us in. He's like the biggest star on the planet. We were wondering if you could get us into the Playboy Mansion. Most definitely. I'm yeah, safe. this is Miss March. You, yeah. And, yeah, I talked to you guys. I think I think it was during South by Southwest. And by the way, you, you, you were funny, and you guys were very down to earth, and you were very kind. But, you know, you've been acting for a while, man. Uh, how much of, how much of uh, acting, how much of that helped out with you eventually directing? Or were you always just directing small films and small things all the time, even when you were a kid? 
I, you know, when I was a kid, I was I was making little little sketches with my friends, and you know, they were terrible, and just but just learning how to do stuff with the camera. But um, you know, when I when I started up with the whitest kids, that was just like boot camp. You know, we had no money, and it was just uh, here's a camera. Let's let's shoot. You know, a sketch a week at least, and you know, it was a it was a a training ground for me to write all the time and and just like make a ton of mistakes and see what works and what didn't. And by the time we got our TV show on the air, I'd been I'd been very prolifically, you know, writing and directing things for for years. You know, so um, it definitely it definitely helped me cut my teeth for sure. And then that movie, Miss March, came out and was such a terrible disaster. Miss March was this movie that I, I didn't want to make in the first place. And uh, I was like in my 20s and, you know, all these people in my life told me, you know, you're not going to get an opportunity like this again. You can rewrite it and direct it and star in it with your best friend. And I said yes for all the wrong reasons. And uh, I don't think the movie works very well. And, and then when it came out and everyone agreed that the movie didn't work, uh, it was really embarrassing, you know? And I, I kind of assumed uh, that I was in director jail and that nobody was ever going to let me direct a movie or write a movie <laughs> again. And I needed to just focus on acting because that's all the work I was fit to do. Um, and so I just became kind of a comedy actor and I was lucky enough to, to be employed for a long time. But... Uh, but it took me about five years to just realize, like, nobody cares about me enough to put me in director jail. I don't matter that much. And so, like, <laughs> if I want to write a movie, I've got to just write a movie. And, and you know, the, the only one really stopping me at this point is me. So I, I had to kind of get over myself and, and try that. And so I wrote a bunch of scripts. And then Barbarian was kind of the, 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 the first one I was able to get anybody on board with. So, so yeah, that, that, that was... Uh, it was a weird trajectory that brought me here. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say that you felt like you were in director jail, and you obviously weren't, so cool, you know, you were able to go out and start working on your next film, which eventually became, you know, Barbarian. But so with Barbarian, though, it is such an unconventional horror film, you know, again, the way you approach it. Uh, did, you have any, did you have any trouble getting this off the ground, getting people on board, oh. getting it funded? Yeah, so it took me it took me two years of, of of knocking on every door that I could in Hollywood before anybody said yes to this. I had I had no's from every company you've ever heard of. Um, <laughs> I went on Wikipedia and I searched every horror movie in the last fifteen years, and I made a spreadsheet of every production company that that made those movies, and I. I made sure the script got to every single one of those companies, and every single one of those companies said no. Um, and so after about two years of this, uh, Trevor, my, my partner, who, who I don't know if you know, he, he actually, uh, he passed a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Which is, um, neither here nor there. But right before, right before he died, he, uh, he told me about these young guys at this company called Boulder Light. And he was like, they really like the whitest kids, but they have, uh, they only make horror movies. And I was like, I got to meet these guys. And so they got the script and they got it immediately. And then they sent it to Roy Lee, who has this company, Vertigo, who made It and The Departed and the Lego movies and all these big mm. movies. And Roy read it. His company had already passed on it. I sent it to them like a year prior. And they, like, it didn't even get to his desk because the reader was like, this is too weird. I mean, everybody said that I had to change all of the things that I loved about the movie. You know, you can't do a reset on page 50. You can't follow a rapist for 30 pages. Nobody wants to watch a movie about anybody in show business. And all the things that everybody hated were the things that I thought made it so special. And, um, and then finally, when Roy actually read it himself, he loved it. And so Roy called me at nine in the morning while I was in bed playing video games and was like, hey, this is Roy Lee and I wanna make your movie. And it was from that moment on, you know, everything changed. And then here's a crazy thing, Corey. So then we raised three and a half million dollars uh, through this French company called Logical. And on the, the day of my going away party to go to Bulgaria to shoot this, my financier died. And it was really tragic <laughs> for a, a, way more reasons than my stupid little movie. But for me, it was especially uh, you know tough because my movie was canceled. Like right, right on the eve of me leaving to go have my big break. And um, you know, it was devastating. And then Roy called Michael Schaefer at New Regency and was like, listen, I, this on Saturday, the next day, he was like, 
I know it's Saturday morning, but like, I got a problem. I need you to read the script today. I need you to get on a Zoom with the director today. And if you like it, I need you to give me an answer today. And so Michael <laughs> read the script. He got on a Zoom with me, and I guess I, I must have passed the smell test. And he raised the budget to $4.5 million and sent me to Bulgaria. And then we shot the movie. And that's how you know, I came back with this like tiny little B-horror movie, but I had New Regency waiting for it. And then we tested it, and then, uh, you know, New Regency's partnered with Fox, who's owned by Disney, and unbeknownst to me, the Disney marketing team came to a test screening, and they loved it. And so I, I wasn't part of any of these conversations of how it was going to be released, but I, I got another amazing phone call. They're like, guess what? Your movie's going to be like a wide theatrical Disney movie. I was just like, oh, my God. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a blessing, dude. It was a dream come true. It, it, it's in, I mean... People don't understand how insane it is to get some of these movies made, man. Uh, Any movie yeah. is a miracle to get made. Any movie, you know, it's crazy. No, no, seriously. And you know, and it, it's funny how some of the movies that I just, again, like yours, I absolutely love, just have these struggle stories behind them, man. You know, and yeah. and, and, and I don't know. It's uh, I it's it's one of the things that I knew when I watched your movie. I said, man, this guy. He got told no by tons of people. I mean, I didn't know it was everybody, but I just looked at it. It was and I everybody. Said, yeah, oh, wow, that's that's. But you know what? You know what else was a, a a blessing about getting told no is that for those two years where I was where I had nothing, I watched the movie in my head every night when I went to sleep. Every night I watched it. So when I when I finally got my yes, I was so ready, Corey. You have no idea. Like I was, I knew every inch of like <laughs> how to design that house. I knew where the camera was gonna go. I was, I was just in the zone in a way that I don't know if I'll ever be able to be again. I hope I will, but like I don't know. But that was, that was the silver lining of having to wait so long. Is that I was, I was prepared. Um, so that 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 did work in my favor. So when having so many nose thrown at you being just shut down by everybody that you tried to get on board with this how's that affected you going forward making another movie because you're going to make another movie right yeah i'm going to make another movie um so it's weird like uh i'm getting a lot of scripts now that uh, you know it's, it's really flattering um but i i think that the best move for me is to i think my next movie should be something that i write so I'm gonna go out of town and basically turn my phone off for three weeks and, and finish a horror movie that I'm writing right now, which is way weirder than Barbarian and way more ambitious. And <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna be any good or not. It might be a mess, I don't know. Uh, but that's good. Like you, you, should feel, you should feel like this might be too crazy, you know? Because if you, if you don't feel like I'm trying something that's almost impossible, then I think you're playing it too safe. So I'm, I'm happy that I feel terrified. But before I wrote Barbarian, I wrote another script that's like my favorite script. I, I like it more than Barbarian. And it's, it's, it's gonna take me a long time to get that made because it takes place in Gotham City. It's like in the Batman universe. And it is, it's not a Batman movie. It's about just a, a, a Joe Schmo who happens to live in Gotham who gets sucked into this like crazy situation. But that is a better script than Barbarian. And one day, maybe it's in seven years, maybe it's longer, but one day I want to make that movie, and uh, and that's another one that I'm ready. Like I, I see it, I've got it. Like that would be amazing. But before that, I'm gonna try and make another horror movie. So if you make this this Gotham movie, is this something that's gonna you you'll have to be involved with DC? I mean, obviously, is there? Property. I would have to be. I yeah. can't I can't do it with like approximations. You know, I I, I it has to be the okay. real deal. I didn't know if it was something where DC said, no, you could just change the name from Gotham to, you know, go them or I've, something. I've, I've thought about that a lot, but I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Well, let me ask you this. So you said you were, you know, everybody closed the door on you when you were trying to get a, a barbarian made. But did you get people who said, well, you know, look, Zach, we'll make this, man, if you just kind of change this right here and make this more uh, uh, mainstream right here. I don't get this, scratch that. You know what I'm saying? Do people just say, I'll, I'll change it if you, I'll make it if you change everything. I didn't have anyone say they would make it because I, I feel like there's always so many hurdles that come before a green light. But I had, for example, a major studio offered to buy the script and then they were going to have someone else direct it. Uh, and I knew that they were going to make all the changes that you're, you're thinking of. And that was just not going to work for me. Um, I had a bunch of, of really exciting places 
you know, tell me they would develop it with me if I was willing to change all those things. And I, yeah, no, to me, it's like the, the joy of the movie is how weird it is, you know? And if, mm -hmm. you, if you sand all those edges off, then you just have another bullshit movie. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make something I'd never seen and that I want to watch, you know? Um, that's my only real thing that I can ever, ever go by is like, what, what, would, what would I like to see? You know, as I was writing the script, I didn't outline anything. I just was typing and following my fingers and thinking, me as an audience member, what would be my favorite thing to happen next? And so um, I have to try and, and maintain that tunnel vision. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because as a director, you are constantly, constantly approached with compromise. You know, and, and that's all the way through the process from from pre-production to production to post. It's, you know, you are and sometimes you have to make those compromises for the good of the movie. But a mm -hmm. lot of times it's about just like putting up a wall and saying, this is my vision. And like, I can't I can't I can't take the easy path here. And so for me, that started in the development where I was like, I cannot I cannot compromise this movie before it even begins. So. You know, I, I, when you talk about how everybody wanted to change it, no, you're exactly right. If they had, that is the point of the movie, just how weird it is. You know, that's yeah. what, that's what makes this movie, man. If they take that away, then it's not, it's, it's not what it is. You know, it's, that doesn't what, yeah. what makes it successful. But now, you know, I look at the success of Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele is, I, I you know, I don't know how it started from him, but it seems like with Hollywood, either people give you nothing but no's, or they give you too many yeses, yeah. and. But with Jordan Peele, after Get Out, it seems like he was able to do any kind of project he wanted to, which would normally be positioned for something like more of a art house film or independent film. He got to make that as blockbusters. Nope mm -hmm. is somewhat of a blockbuster movie that is way different than any of the blockbusters you have out there. And nobody would have taken a chance on it if Jordan Peele hadn't had the success of Get Out. So are you yeah. getting to that point now where, all right, you were the, you're, you're the, the guy with the weird script and that was too weird for everybody. Now are you at that point where it's like, well, you know, give, this guy, he might be a genius. Give him whatever he wants. You know, let him do what he wants to do. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm able to, I think I can get a little bit riskier on my next script. You know, I, I love Jordan's trajectory. I think that is an amazing uh, path that he's, he's made for himself. I would rather take the path of, of the Coen brothers, you know, where like mm -hmm. their model is they keep the budget down and so they get to make the movie that they want to make. And, and no one gets too bent out of shape if it's commercial or not commercial. They just, they make movies for themselves. And um, and I, I definitely am interested in, in making commercial movies. Don't get me wrong. I want as many people as possible to like my movies. I'm not trying to make, you know, challenging art here. I, I mean, it is art, but I don't, you know, I, I want it to be popcorn. I want it to be wide theatrical. I want it to. I want it to be fun, um, but I also want it to be, you know, uh, authentically me. And, and so I feel like the best way to protect myself is to keep it a little bit smaller. Um, I don't think I'll ever make an, a uh, a nope. You know what I mean? And that's not a knock against nope. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just that's too big for me. You know, I think ultimately. That's actually pretty. That's that's kind of humble, man. That's really cool to hear. You know. I mean, it's not, that's, I'm stealing here the Coen brothers, you know, they, they've articulated this and I'm really just parroting what they've said, but I think it's really, I think it's really wise. Well, no, I think that uh, it's a very humbling answer, or a very humble answer, but it's also very, I think it's very smart. I, I, you know, what I was just saying, some people get too many yeses. Uh, there are people out there who have just, they were given too much money, man. You know, let's just, let's just say what it is. They were given too much money and too much, too much power and, and, and that thing that really made them the thing that where, they, where their creativity really shined, it wasn't there anymore because they were just they didn't really have the hurdles or the, you know that they had before. Uh, I think it's smart to try to keep your budget low and make the kind of movies you want to make. You know, I think that's kind of cool that you said yeah. that. Um, you know, with 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 uh, making this film though, and we would, I'm going back to expectations that people that you might have given the audience. Uh, the casting definitely did play into that. You know, we were talking about how, you know, when yeah, when Bill Skarsgård opens that door, that that's not Bill. I don't care if he has on the makeup or not. That's Pennywise to people. Yeah, I know. I yeah, know. You know, and that's and, and people even when they see him open the door, I don't care how handsome this guy is. People are like, "Oh shit, is that clown?" So, yep. Now, was it your intention to get him the whole time? 
I didn't write anything with any actor in mind, so I'd be lying if I said this was all some genius plan that I had, but he was the first actor we went to because I know the history that he has with everybody. If you're a horror fan, you know Bill as Pennywise, and that's perfect for us. So, uh, yes, it was very intentional, and, and I, in my opinion, it worked great. You know, people, people are right where you want them to be. That's great. And similarly with Justin, you know, we think of Justin as this you know, sweet golden retriever. And now I make him this horrible rapist. And uh, that's, that's kind of an upside down. And so I, I really, I feel like I got so lucky to have both of those guys come on board. Yeah, I don't know how you what how you got Justin Long, man, or what you had to go through to get him or if it was, you know, if you just let him see the script, and it was that easy. But he really, I mean, he was great in the film, man. He's, he's so good. I, no, your whole cast is amazing. And I'll tell you why. So you, good. you know, the, the, everybody in this movie gives you a different expectation. You know, uh, uh, Bill Skarsgård, he he instantly makes you feel creepy. Uh, your actress, I forgot her name. What? Uh, she, she's Georgina great, Campbell. She she starts. She's she's the one that kind of distracts for a little while, man. Makes you forget that you're watching a horror movie. You know, she's kind of bringing in this romantic side of the film, and then Justin Long. I mean, you don't you don't know what the hell is going on with him, but yeah. he kills it in this movie, man. He's a, yeah. he's amazing. Uh, how did you go about the casting with this? Well, I mean, it was it, it, I, you get on a Zoom with the actor and you you plead your case, you know. And for me, as as an actor, I I know that I respond to praise. And, um, you know, all <laughs> actors crave praise. And so my secret, and it's not a, it's, it's not a dirty little secret, but when I'm, when I'm trying to, to entice an actor to work with me, I just, I praise them like obscenely, like, like too much. You know, I just, I, I really lay it on thick and I'm not lying. I'm not being disingenuous. I, I believe that Georgina and Bill are, are fantastic talents and I make sure that they know how much I value them. And, and I don't think enough directors do that. And so yeah. um, I made it an easy yes. And I, and I also make this pitch. And, and Corey, tell me if you agree with me, but I have a theory about horror movies, and I, I would love mm. to hear what you think of this. I think that every horror movie that is actually scary, that's actually good, will always find its audience. It doesn't matter if it comes out on Shutter. It doesn't matter if you put it on YouTube or you have mm -hmm. a wide theatrical release because I can't think of a single truly terrifying horror movie that has not been appreciated by the horror community because we, we search it out so much and when we find it, we tell everybody. And like, I, I, I made that appeal to them and, um, and I think they agreed with me. And, and I think they agreed that I had a scary script and if I'm not an incompetent fool, you know, they're good actors. It's mine to mess up, but I, I just... Uh, you know, I assured them that I wouldn't, and uh, and here we are. I mean, do you think that's true? Do you think that like all good horror movies eventually will find their their people? Hell yes, I do, one hundred percent. And let me tell you why. That takes me back to when I was eleven and twelve years old, man. And I just it, it, when I would go to the to the video store, and I would go over there to the horror section, and I would just I would just search for it, anything that seemed interesting. And yeah, yeah and, and you know, if, it, if it's something that was that, that was selling me, if it was something that looked cool, if it was something that read well in the box, I don't, you know, I didn't, I didn't go there with recommendations. I went there because I just wanted to watch a good horror movie, and I knew there was a yeah. bunch of just stuff out there I didn't know about. And when I found something that was amazing, you damn right I went out and told everybody, man. You know, I couldn't wait to put people on board. Yeah. I mean, I, I got Blair Witch Projects given to me on a blank VHS like a year before it came out in theaters because some guy was like, watch this, it'll fuck you up. And then I watched it, it fucked me up. And then I invited, I had parties at my house like four or five times where I would invite a new group of friends over to just watch this movie, you know, and it worked. And, and I, I just think that that's how horror operates. It's kind of like that band. It's like you hear that band that nobody else likes and now you feel like you own this band and you want to be yeah. the one to tell people. And that's, that's, that's what I think has happened with Barbarian. You know, we did not have a big promotional, you know, canvassing of the world. Like it was a Twitter campaign from people that liked the movie and they felt the need to tell their friends. And now, you know, we're adding 500 theaters this week. In our third week, we're adding 500 theaters. And it's not because we've been plastered all over buses and billboards and stuff. It's because people are telling their friends to go see the movie. And I, I'm, I, that to me is the most gratifying thing of, I could ask for. It's, a, it's just the word of mouth. Well, first of all, congratulations on that. Thank you, man. Yeah, no, you, you, it, couldn't, it couldn't happen to a better movie or a better person, man. Second of all, no. 
Yeah. Horror movies, they're just, in horror in general, man, you know, the reason why people are so quick to spread it, and you tell me if you agree with this, but the reason why horror movies function like they do is because I think they're one of the most social experiences that you have in, yes. a, in a theater. You know, people get together to be scared together and talk about this movie together and share the visceral moments together. Horror movies, if they work, they're full of oohs and ahs and grabbing on the yeah. things. And we all want to share that in one room. And that's why it's such a communicable, communicable thing, man. I agree, man. It's like the energy in the theater elevates everybody. You tap into that communal electricity and it's so much more fun. It's like, I don't want to watch a, a roller coaster on my TV at home. I want to go to a theme park and get on the ride and go and experience with other people. Like that's, yep. that's, that's what it is to me, man. And your movie, man, it's such a different way that we consume stuff too today. I mean, you know, I think unfortunately because of digital, we often don't watch things together as much as we used to. I mean, we still yeah. do. You know, horror movies still work where we go to an Alamo th Draft House Theater or something, we share that moment together. There's still a community there for horror. <laughs> but I remember before things hit like they did now, people were, like you said, people would see something. It would bring people in to watch it with them, especially if it yeah. worked like your movie. I don't know if you remember the movie Wreck, but I remember getting Wreck and, and, and people would say, somebody passed it on to me and they said, hey, I'm not saying anything about this. Just watch it. And by the way, get about three or four other people and watch it, man. And it was a movie that just kind of turned all of us all of a sudden. And it was great to sit up there after you had seen it, watch other people's expressions, like be like, what the fuck is this? And yeah, dude. your movie, your movie takes it back to something like that. You don't really have a lot of movies today where, you know, especially the more conventional horror films where people can sit down and actually sit there and watch somebody else's expression because they don't know what the hell is coming up. Your movie yeah. works that way, man. That's why that movie's spreading so well with word of mouth. I think so. I think so. Uh, sorry, we lost, the connection lost there at the end. So if I was quiet when you finished your point, it's, uh, I didn't mean to be rude. But yeah, I think you're right, man. And I, I really enjoy going and see. I've seen this movie a hundred times at this point, And I still get a big kick out of going to the theater just because I like to watch the audience watch the movie. And I, I've had a lot of people message me saying like they like going the second and third time because yeah. they just like watching their friends experience those, those weird moments. And that's, that's the best. No, nah, man. And, and let me tell you, man, Zach is right about, about actors wanting to be flattered. He told me before we started, he's like, I'm going to admit to you, man, the reason, how, the reason why I found out about you, Corey, he said, I, because I was just online, just scoping around to see who gave me good reviews. <laughs> you know, who, I, who I, loved I, my 100%. Movie. No, well, actually, Roy Lee, my, my producer, who is the best, by the way, and you should have him on the show because he, he, I think he's a big fan of yours also, but he sent your, your review to me. And so, of course, I, I was like, well, Roy wouldn't send this if it was bad, so you bet your ass <laughs> I'm going to watch it. And then, and then I loved it. And then, but then I watched a bunch of your stuff. And I was saying before we got on the air, but I think it's so cool that you watched The Strange Thing About the Johnsons and you, you knew, you just smelled that Ari Aster was the real deal, and he is. And I just, like, I remember you were like, this guy is going to make something that's going to be really, really special. You called that, man. And not a lot of people understood that short film, you know? It, it was really, you know, he was kind of trolling everybody, but he made something really, I think, vibrant and important and, like, really smart and terrifying. And, like, I was just very impressed that you got it immediately. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was super cool, dude. Man. Uh, look at that. What a crazy movie that is. Man, man this is. And it was this... funny that you were laughing that that guy looks like you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? People have often, uh, they've looked at this. I've heard already. People already said, yeah, that's you, man. <laughs> they've already made memes. <laughs> they've already made memes of me getting raped by somebody looking like, cause that, yeah. you know, it has to do with the movie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man. It's, and, and people thought. People thought that I was crazy when I was talking about this film, man. People, uh, that I, they, well, I, yeah. would, I would show this and they'd be like, people look at me and they'd be like, man, what, what is wrong with you showing this yeah. to people? You know, I was like, I don't know. I think it's brilliant. I do too. I and do I, too. And I'm glad that you said that because that's what I said. I said, man, this guy, he's, he's messing with people. You know, this yeah. is, it's weird, but this is, this is a comedy to him. I'm laughing at this, you know? Yeah. It's funny, he definitely has a real sense of humor, and I'm very excited to see what he does with Disappointment Boulevard, because he says it's like a four hour long comedy. And it's like, I've also heard him say he thinks Hereditary is really funny. Now, when I watch Hereditary, I don't find it that funny. I get that like, you could have a sick sense of humor about the head and the pole, and that's <laughs> so jarring that you might laugh, but I don't think you're laughing because it's like, 
knee slappingly funny. What what do you think of that? I I think okay. So this is this is not me saying that I I know this guy because I don't I don't I don't know Ari Aster man. But I do admire his work a lot. Uh, oh. oh uh, what was the movie that was in Sweden? Uh, I love that movie. Midsummer. Man. Midsummer. Mid- Midsummer. Yeah, I love Midsummer. And I, and I think because I saw the strange thing about the Johnsons, and I saw the humor in it. I saw him trolling people. I saw this someone as a comedy, a sick, twisted comedy. I think that I see that in all of his work now. And, yeah, and I mean yeah, that, yeah. I mean that in the best way because Midsummer. When I watched that, man, I was. I was, you know, I was, I was frightened. I was kind of repulsed by some things, but at the same time, I was, I was laughing my ass off at a lot of it. And people thought, looking at me, like, what is wrong with you? You know, so. No, no, you're right. You're right. It is funny, and it's intentionally funny. Like Will Poulter peeing on the on the log and having that guy just hate him for the rest of the movies. That's funny, dude. Yeah, the guy that does the the whole crane kick kung fu move before he jumps off the cliff. You know. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I, I just, I think the guy's brilliant. I think he's a brilliant visionary director, man. And I and I just, every, he set the tone when I saw the, the strange thing about the Johnsons. And I just see that kind of wicked, sinister, funny side to him and everything he does now. Which, I mean, and that's, yeah. a, and that's a compliment. You know? Yeah, I, I hear you. I agree, man. I think he's great. I can't wait to see what he does. I mean, I'll, I've, I've bought season tickets for Ari Aster. <laughs> Whatever he makes, I'm there opening day. You, you got my money. One hundred percent. Same same thing, man. I you know, there's yeah. a lot of people I look forward to seeing. What, what, I, let me change that. There's, there's not a a lot. There's a handful of people that I'm just excited when I just hear the mere mention of them doing something. He's one of them. You're one of them now. Yeah. So you know. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm I'm very sorry about about Trevor, man. Uh, he, when I interviewed you when Miss Marsh came out, he, I interviewed him as well. You you both were very funny. Um, yeah. you know, was was he into horror as well? No, he didn't like horror. It, it, it is a bummer because uh, I have a lot of friends like this. I bet you do too, where it's just like they just don't get it. They're like, it's a movie. How, how am I supposed to be scared of a movie? <laughs> um, and so I, I wonder what he would have thought of Barbarian. I think he would have, of course, he would have been really happy for me. But I think, uh, I think ultimately, I don't think it would have worked on him. I don't, I don't, you know, he never was interested in going to see horror movies. So I, I don't know. I don't know. So you wouldn't have never worked on anything together as far as a horror film then? Well, actually, we talked about writing a thriller together for, believe it or not, Adam Sandler. And this is not endorsed by Adam Sandler. It's just we both thought we had a really funny idea for this Adam Sandler movie that would be kind of a a thriller horror. But it was going to be kind of a a comedy first and a a thriller second. Um, So so it's not that he was, like, totally not interested in, in that sort of a thing. Uh, you know, I want to, not to just drop this right here, I just want to ask this before I forget. I was, uh, it's, it's cool to be able to talk to, you know, people when they have a movie that you love and you see things in there that, that, they do, that you think they did so well. But you wonder, man, how did, they, how did they do that? How did they get that done? Okay, what? What? I love this sort of stuff. Like what? Okay, so you went to Bulgaria to shoot yeah. this movie. So what I was really impressed with and what just kind of made me want to figure out how you did this so in the beginning now the movie takes place in detroit for people who don't know and it's a again it's an airbnb move airbnb gone wrong but one of the first things one of the first signs that this airbnb is not a good place to be is that it's in a it's it's in a bombed out area of detroit man <laughs> i mean it's this it's, it's like it's like the the leave it to beaver house surrounded by crack houses man and yeah. so that's one of the things that I was noticing in the movie. It starts out in this really shitty neighborhood, and there's this one nice, pristine house in the middle of all these terrible houses. And then there's a flashback where that same house is there in the nice, pristine uh, uh, appearance that it has. But it's a nice neighborhood back in the day. Everything else is nice. Right. So how did you do it to where you were able to shoot that house in the bad part of Detroit, but also film it in this very nice neighborhood. Okay, so we filmed in Bulgaria for most of our stuff, and this neighborhood with that house is in Bulgaria, and we we built this neighborhood in a field. So we erected 13 facades um, to be all the houses we're gonna see with our night's house, and, and the first thing we did is we built all these 13 houses to look wrecked, and we shot that first. 
And then mm -hmm. I planned out exactly what we would see in the flashback. And so I knew like we need to see these houses. So like if in that flashback, if the camera had panned right or left, it would have looked like bombed out. But in just the precise little pocket that we see, um, we so we shot our ruined neighborhood. Then we knew what was going to be nice, and then we moved to interiors for like you know three weeks. Mm -hmm. And while we were shooting interiors, the art team was re re refabbing, I guess is the word, um, the neighborhood to look like like the '80s flashback. And so then the last thing we shot was the neighborhood in the '80s. And all that grass is dead, so that's like CGI grass <laughs> and. Um, and things like that, but you know, uh, they had basically three weeks to turn a bombed out fake neighborhood into a, a nice, healthy fake neighborhood. Wait a minute, that's CG grass? Yeah, because the grass kept dying, and then we were like trying to spray paint the grass, and then that <laughs> looked like a football field, and that didn't work. So, so that grass that you're looking at there is like mostly computer, which was actually like the biggest effect shot in the whole movie was that grass, because. I kind of had a rule that I didn't want us to do anything that John Carpenter couldn't do when he was making the thing. Because I, I hate CG in horror movies. I think it just looks fake. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted the, the monster to be totally practical. That's just makeup and, and you know, prosthetics. Uh, there's a little bit of CG where, like, some of the seams, like, on her, on her body are, like, you can kind of see the seam and the rubber and the flesh. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit of CG. But really, the grass is the big special effect. <laughs> So that's the Isn't biggest, that weird yeah, that again, you know, this is why I love talking to people and having them a little bit behind the scenes in the movies, because I never that's I tell you what, you say that grass is the biggest CG scene. The, that grass is one of the best effects that I've seen all year, <laughs> you know, because because <laughs> I, I, I didn't question it. You know, I thought it was grass. Yeah, man. yeah. Now, I also have to say, though, it's important to say that we did film in Brightmoor, which is the neighborhood that this takes place in. So we went to Detroit and we did film there for two days. And so all the stuff where she's like driving through the neighborhood and walking through the neighborhood, that's yeah. us actually in Detroit doing it. So we're not we're not total phonies, but um, there was just no possible way that we could do what we needed to do where we could like revamp a street and make it look fresh like mm -hmm. in the 80s in actual Detroit. It would have been insanely expensive and yeah. we, we just couldn't do it. So it's impressive what you did do, man. I mean, like Thank how much you. does it cost to go? So I'm looking at these these nice houses next to the house with the Airbnb. So I'm guessing that there's nothing inside of those. That's just all outside appearance. They're totally empty. And that and our Airbnb house is also totally empty. So like we had to get really creative when she's at the front porch and we're shooting Bill inside and we're shooting her outside. It's like I was worried that we were going to have to film that on two different days, you know, because um, you see in the house and that house is just a hollow shell. But luckily we were able to like put up a fake wall behind Bill and uh, and and so it looks almost right. That's that's on a on a set there, mm -hmm. but on the scene where he opens the door and says, "Yeah, that's on our neighborhood street." And so we had to kind of build two sets. It's it's maybe this is complicated. And I know I kind of get what you're that, saying. That there, that's that's all fake. So that's just like a fake ceiling and a fake wall right behind him. <laughs> look like the set. Wow. Well, you I mean, I got to be impressive of, at how. And how, uh, uh, you know, movies really are kind of magic tricks, man. They are. They are. And that's so fun to try and figure out how to, how to fake it. You know, so much of every movie you see is just hanging by a thread, you know. And um, even big budget movies, it's all just like mm -hmm. you've got to be creative and you've got to think about, like, what's, what's the easiest way? Here's an example. Do you remember at the end of the movie when they're on top of the water tower? Oh, yeah. You know? So like we couldn't shoot on top of that water tower because it's really high and dangerous and we would never get like, we just couldn't bring the actors up there. So what we did is, you know, we built a fake top of a water tower on a sound stage and we, and we couldn't, we didn't have the money for a blue screen or like a CGI background because this is a basically, you know, super low budget movie. So we, we hung a black wrap, like black fabric along the edge of the, of the set and then we just punched holes in it and put light behind the holes so that those holes look like city lights in the background. And they're just out of focus, so they just they perfectly look like you're on a on top of a thing at night. And then you put a little wind machine and suddenly you look in the camera and it just looks like you're standing up on top of a water tower. But it's really just like black fabric and like Christmas lights, basically. Wow. Um, man. And that's the kind of thing that's like that's so cheap. You know, that costs like no money and it looks great, and you have to come up with stupid stuff like that all the time when you're making a movie and I, I love that kind of thing. 
This is why I like when people work with lower budgets. This is why I was yeah. saying that with higher budgets, you know, people are given too many yeses. I mean, it, everything's, everything comes a little bit too easy. Everything, and that's when things become phony looking. You know, you, you, I agree. You, you know, you know, like I'm watching Andor right now. I don't know if you're a Star Wars fan or not, but I'm watching Andor, and a lot of that stuff is shot on location. It's not shot with that, that this new computer technology where they can just make virtual sets wherever they go. You know, it, it, feels, yeah. it feels tangible. Uh, you know, a lot, of t- a lot of times when people get a lot of, you know, a huge budget, you know, a lot surrounded by a lot of yes people, things are just done at the press of a button. You know, there's ingenuity. Yeah. If, now, I'm, not, I'm not discrediting any crews that work on big, bigger budget movies. I'm just saying, man, when you work with a lower budget, there's a lot more ingenuity and creativity that you have to have to do those things. Yeah. I mean, having limitations uh, is is a big part of creative processes. You know, uh, I, I really think that without limitations, um, a lot of times the art can suffer. And and I think that uh, you know, we, we've just seen it a lot. And, and you, you, you said it perfectly. I can only echo what you said. But yeah, when you have more money, you can do more things. And, and sometimes you suffer because of it. I got to ask, man, this 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 trailer mm. and I, I'll be honest with you man I didn't know anything about the movie and, and until they told us we had a screening for it and I actually had to miss the screening so I, so I, I gave I gave the movie my money man I paid to go see it it was oh well it, thank it, you I appreciate it it was more than happy to do it but everybody had come back and told me how great it was and it's funny because oh, cool. I normally would have been at the screening it's just like just got so busy that day that I could not go and one of the things with the movies that I didn't, I, you know, I didn't see the trailer. The movie wasn't being pushed a whole lot at the time. But even when I went and watched the, the trailer finally, I said, man, this trailer makes me want to watch this movie more. Because the trailer didn't tell me a damn thing about the movie. You know, you, yeah. you're only, and this is a rare thing, you're only getting half the movie really from this trailer. You're not, you know, you're not even. Get, yeah, you're not, yeah, not even, the, not even that. You're getting like the first quarter of the movie from this trailer right here. How much... Did you have to do with that, if anything? Because no one does that today. I, I, so I, I wish I could take credit for that trailer, but I, I can't. Like, Disney was on board from the very beginning about let's protect the movie, let's not spoil the movie. And they were very, very solicitous of my opinion when they were cutting the trailer. So I was working with them, and I was putting together these ideas I had and sending them clips, and I was crafting this trailer that I was making. And it was, it was Corey, it was bad. Like, uh, I can admit it, it was not very good. And we were nearing the, the deadline. And and, um, and Joe uh, at Disney, he sent me, he was like, just look at this. I've been tinkering with it on the side. Tell me if you hate it. And it was the trailer that exists. It was just that. Like, he just did that. And I was like, oh, my God, you saved me. And so I didn't. I didn't have any kind of locking of horns with, with the marketing about this movie. They, they really took the ball and ran with it, and I think they did a great job. Oh, they did an excellent job, man. I mean, yeah. like I said, it's rare that people don't... And I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a person who just... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, when they, when, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, 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 that crazy about spoilers, man, when people mention spoilers. I'm not, I'm not that much of a spoiler bitch or anything, you know. I'm I'm, I'm okay with them, with people saying certain <laughs> a things. A spoiler bitch is really funny. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not. <laughs> I'm okay with people. You know, I'm one of those people who. There's some people who don't even want to know the title of the movie. You know that. I'm okay yeah, yeah. with some things, uh, being said. But a lot. Of, I do agree that there are a lot of movies out there that do reveal a little bit too much sometimes. And like I said, it was rare that you saw this with a trailer like this, which actually I think is 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 something that helps the movie out a lot too. Um, well, you know, a new trailer dropped today. Did you, have you seen the new trailer that they did? No, today. So it's interesting, and I, I, I think I'm in support of it. But it's basically it follows Justin, and it makes it look like a uh, like a like a comedy. So it's like it starts with him in Malibu, and it's that Donovan song is the score of the trailer. And it's like, oh, this actor's having a hard time. And it's like from the director of the Whitest Kids You Know, and the producer <laughs> of the Lego Movie, and they're really making it look like a comedy. And then it gets him into the house, and then it, it turns horror, and then it's like from the creator, you know, the, the producer of It. And then it, it does that. And it's a great trailer. And I, I but, you know, it does, um, it does give away the Justin stuff. But I feel like we're three weeks in, you know, we've already cast our first net. And anyone that that net didn't work on, let's throw another net out and see if we can get, get other people that would, that would be interested with this. Oh, trailer. definitely. So it's, it's a spoiler, but I think it's okay. 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's been out for a while. See who else you can yeah. get with it. It's, it's, a, it's a smart marketing tactic, man, I think. I think so. Yeah, it's not bad at all, man. Uh, so I was talking to you about South by Southwest a little while ago. South by Southwest is here in, in Austin, Texas, for people who don't know, which a lot of people do. Uh, I interviewed you at, at South by at that time. Uh, and also, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but your wife is actress Sarah Paxton. I think it just she was in Blonde, right? She was in Blonde, yeah. Yeah, I just saw her in Blonde, and which she's a, a great actress, but I, you two are married, and you were married here in Austin? We were married in Austin. I, well, we met on a movie in Austin um, that's called, it has the unfortunate title. It's one of those movies that like got bought by a distributor who like made them take a terrible title. It's called Love and Air Sex. Awful title, really good movie by this Austin filmmaker named Brian Poyser, who's, who's amazing. And uh, so we met on that movie. We met in Austin, and we loved Austin, and so it was a really special city for us, so we wanted to get married there. How often do you come to Austin? Not enough, not enough. But, you know, it used to be about twice a year, and now after the pandemic, you know, I think it's, I've been back once. So I want to go back more, though. Man, and I know Brian Poison, man. I knew I knew you Brian. You do? Yeah, I knew Brian from uh, years ago, man. He made he made a movie with uh uh, uh Kadeem Hardison uh back in the day. Was it Lovers of Hate? No, I know and I know Lovers of Hate. It was before that. It was something the uh, Knipsey Twins or I forgot the name of the movie. Well, Actually, he's the best, man. Corey, next time I'm in Texas, can you, me, and Brian, can we get barbecue or something to hang out? I haven't seen Brian in years. I think the last time that he had that movie come out that I was talking about and we all had dinner at a... This is years ago. This is probably back in... Man, this is back in like 2000... 2006 is the last yeah, time. Yeah, that's a while ago. But, but Brian, I, I, I knew Brian back in the day, but man, listen... It'll be a great way to reconnect if you yeah, come. Yeah, come on, let's do it. I you, want to yeah. do it. Let's do it. If you come to Austin, right. I'd, I'd, I'd love to just. I'd love to hang out anyway, man. Yeah, you know, man, I, I'm there. I'd love it. Yeah, so I, I hope you make it here soon, man. And you know, again, I, I I know you're busy. You got a lot going on. You know, your movies out there right now, so people are trying to. They're knocking at your door. But I, man, this is a, this has been a a great discussion. I love I love I talking to you. I agree. Hey, Corey, I'll tell you if if you ever want. To have more of this about talking about any other movies, please think of me as as friend of the show. I would be more than happy to come on and talk about movies that aren't mine. So uh, I know you have some guests on sometimes. So uh, please include me in your uh, in your guest list. Okay? Hey, hey, man, I would love that. How about I tell you what? How about in a month or so? If you're not busy, yeah, I'll find if the, what you, you get. Obviously, you're into horror, so maybe the next horror thing that comes out, you can come and talk yeah. about it or something. I'm in, dude. I would love it. Well, hey, man. Uh, thank you so and I'll much. Have a better, I'll have a better internet connection next time. I promise. I'm, I'm embarrassed about my, my internet connection today. Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as you think, man. It was a couple of okay. hiccups here and there. You're talking to somebody who goes through this all the time, man. This shit is okay, nothing okay. for me. I'm beyond ever panicking when something like this happens. You, it was perfect. <laughs> it was fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, man. That, no, really. It has been uh, a, a pleasure talking to you. This, this, you know, and I always have good interviews with people, man. They're great, but you know, some of the best are when the interviews just turn like straight out conversations, which is what this I, was. Th I agree. That's what you want, man. Yeah. So I, I hope we do talk again. I'm definitely going to reach out to you in about a month or two. I'd love to have you come on and just talk about movies with us at some point. And hey, man, congratulations on everything that's happened. Uh, you deserve it. I love the movie. I'm turning people onto this movie. It's definitely something that I'm going to be showing people when they come around. So thank you for making it, man. And by the way, your movie, I'm going to tell you something. Your movie was a gift. And I know that's a very pretentious thing to say, but your movie came out on my birthday. So it was oh. like a, <laughs> so it was All a, right, happy this, birthday. Yeah, it was on September 9th. So I was like, well, you know what? Cool. They, it, what couldn't ask for a better gift from somebody who doesn't That's even know awesome, me. So. Man. That's awesome. So yeah, man. Uh, and congratulations on the thing you're making next. I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing about that. Well, it's not, it's not, I haven't even finished writing it. So I, I don't have a green light or I don't know if I'm gonna make it or not, but no congratulations. But uh, I I appreciate your well wishes. Ah, uh, you'll get it done, man. You know you'll. Ah, uh, we'll see. We'll yeah, see. yeah. You're the next. You're the next uh, horror art uh, art tour out there. Of course, you're gonna get it, man. So keep it keep it cool. Keep it cool. <laughs> don't, hey, don't blow my head up. Are you you're in L.A. right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, man. Uh, maybe sometime if I because yeah, I go to L.A. every now and then. I, you're a busy guy. I won't ever bother you. But maybe hey, ne next time. No, no, I'm, no. You bother you bother me. You I, I want you to bother me. In fact, when we're off. 
recording, I'll give you my my phone number, and my email, and you oh, please be, bother me. No, that'd be awesome, man. I just I, you're just a yeah. pleasure to talk to everybody. Zach Kreger, uh, the movie is as I've been saying over and over again. The movie is Barbarian. Check it out. It is one of the, if not the best horror movie this year. That was our whole thing when we did our thumbnail, we did our title. The best horror movie of the year is what we said. So please check this out. It's been a great time talking, and an honor talking to you, Zach. The, you know, the, the, you're just a, the, such the a, pleasure a, was truly mine, dude. Such really a, an amazing Thanks, talent. So, all right, everybody. And Zach, I'm going to let you go to it, man. Thank you so much. Well, I'll tell you what. Just stick around, and I will get off the air right now, and then we'll exchange information. So let me just close this yeah. out. So, everybody, as you see, I got to get out of here. I don't want to keep this man waiting, but please check us out. Not just here. I don't push the channel enough. You know our channel. You know what we do. You know where to find us on every place. But I don't push double toasted interviews enough. Please check it out. There's a lot of people that I've been interviewing on there. Again, people that have been my heroes, people that I admire. It, I've, I've been able to live a very fortunate life because of you guys out there. So don't you ever, it don't, I don't ever want to hear about you hesitating to get a hold of me. You know what to do. K Cool Mans at gmail.com that's k-c-o-o-l-m-a-n-z at gmail.com you email us with any kind of questions comments compliments insults input and our advice you can find us on the instagrams the twitters the facebook's you know we got a patreon out there tiktok is doing well for us right now just go to those platforms type in double toast it'll take you where you need to go and i always tell you that if you're in austin texas Please come and see us. Just don't come sneaking up on people. Don't come rolling up on people up in here talking about, I'm here in town. We got busy schedules too. We got things to do. So don't be rude. Don't be creepy. Email us, kcoolmans at gmail.com. Let us know what those plans are for Austin. Are you moving here? Are you just passing through? Whatever you're doing, let us know ahead of time. We'll clear our schedules and maybe, just maybe, okay, all right, we'll hang out with you. And we'll have shows coming up this week, as always. So please check us out. Until then, good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are listening to or watching this, goodbye and stay toasty.